Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for showing up to our health equity webinar of today. Uh, my name is Manuela Valle Castro, and I'm the director of the Division of Social Accountability. I'm so glad to see some of the peeps that are here today, like some students and some amazing advocates from the community. So welcome, welcome. Make yourself at home, grab a seat, say hello if you want, put in your camera and say hello to the person next to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're gonna get started. Um, we as in the Division of Social Accountability hold these health equity webinars around once a month and we try to address priority health concerns of the community, uh, bringing in the voices of community practitioners, advocates, and folks uh, from the healthcare system as well. Um, so let's, we're going to get started with our uh, webinar of today called We Are Not There Yet gender-based inequities in healthcare by um, uh, recognizing that we are operating and having this, doing this work in Treaty 6 territory. And uh, the DSA is a settler unit that, of course, it's part of a settler colonial organization. And as such, we are constantly reflecting and working towards understanding what are our responsibilities as settlers in Treaty 6. How can we um, take responsibility and accountability for the colonial harms that uh, need to be addressed and redressed? How can we, uh, and we're seeking allyship uh, with uh, the indigenous sovereign nations of Treaty 6. Uh, so it's an ongoing work for us. This is uh, something that really grounds all the work that we're, everything that we're gonna be talking about today is on the recognition that these are indigenous lands in which we you know, uh, are understanding more and more the layers of harm of intergenerational harm that colonial policies uh, have caused and, uh, and how they relate today specifically to persisting gender inequities. So we wanted to focus on gender-based inequities, of course, because uh, March 8th was International Women's Day, which, um, you know, we, um, I, I like to invite you all to really um, reflect a little bit more about the meaning of the commemoration of International Women's Day. Um, I, personally have not been very comfortable with some kind of like cooptations and appropriations of International Women's Day by some forms of very um, uh, white and liberal feminism that kind of like just celebrates kind of like personal individual entrepreneurship or things like, you know, they're, 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 they've been kind of like selling us a form of feminism that it's kind of like based on an individual self-improvement project rather than a collective systemic transformation. So I think we always have to stay kind of like critical and, uh, and, and reflective, right, about what are we doing when we're commemorating International Women's Day? Uh, how can we keep, you know, the, the, the meaning of the feminist social movement, right, moving, right, keeping us moving forward as we, uh, as the feminist movement has been also called in, right, uh, by the third wave to also recognize the voices of racialized women, of colonized third world women, non-Western voices, as well as, as, well as non-binary and queer trans women, right, who have been who are always reminding us that um, no women can ever speak for all women, right? And that we always have to keep our analysis very intersectional uh, to remember that uh, gender is always intersecting with other forms of power and oppression. 
uh, to recognize the impact of our economic inequities and the economic kind of like models that we, uh, you know, uh, are under, right? Um, and also to, to reflect how, what does it mean for us in Saskatchewan, uh, where we do have some of the worst outcomes in terms of gender-based inequities. I'm gonna say it right away in terms of indicators uh, of um, uh, violence, gender-based violence. We have some of the worst, worst rates in Saskatchewan. And, uh, and we have some specificities as a province, um, like the fact that we were just talking with Christina that we're 50% rural and remote communities. So uh, I, I, I had the luck of working with some of the people here in the past uh, doing research about uh, gender-based violence in Saskatchewan. And I remember the one of the conclusions that stood out the most for me was, uh, and this was from an, one of our interviewees that said, wherever there is an power imbalance, there is vulnerability to violence, right? And that just stuck with me. So I'm very excited to introduce you today to uh, the folks that we have invited to present today. Two of them are from our brilliant, brilliant students. I'm so excited and, and proud to introduce you to Aishwarya Ganamani, her pronouns are she, her, and Giovanna Miladinovic also she, her, who are second year medical students in Saskatoon at the UFS here at the College of Medicine. They are currently the co-presidents of the Gender Engagement in Medicine student group, uh, having started in the, in the group last year as the junior sexual health representative and the junior 2S LGBTQAS represented respectively. Aishwarya has a background in biology and psychology prior to starting medical school and a keen interest in working with women and women's health issues in her future career. Giovanna has a background in molecular biology. Wow. And would love to work with members of the 2S LGBTQIS plus community with a focus on adolescents. I mean, look at these stars. And um, and then we also have Christina Kaminsky, who is the Collaborative Community Justice Coordinator of the Sexual Assault Services of Saskatchewan, also known as SACS. They have the best acronym of all organizations. Christina is a whiteboard wizard, funding development queen, and systems change advocate who has been working to combat the issue of sexual health violence in the past eight years. She began her journey as a volunteer for a crisis line for survivors and then came to SAS to become a certified first responder facilitator and help launch, organize, and coordinate Saskatchewan's first violence against women advocate case review. She is currently advancing collaborative ways to address the gaps in health and justice system responses to sexual violence through the creation of a network of institutions and community-based leaders to promote systemic change. Christina's work at SAS is driven by her desire to live in a world where she and her generation of other women and girls can live a life to their greatest, wildest, and fullest possibilities without the experience of sexualized violence. Outside of SAS, Christina loves to nurture her large collection of plants. She's a fellow plant lady cook without following recipe directions, and adventure with her Australian blue healer, Bowie, on the treaty lands four, five, six, eight, and 10, upon which she's a guest. So please help me welcome our fabulous guests of today. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, they will be presenting for 15 minutes each. And then we will have time for questions and answers from you and hopefully some fruitful discussion. So help me welcome our guests and I'm gonna invite Giovanna and Ashwarya. 
Awesome, thank you. I'll just share some of the slides we've got here. Um, also wanted to mention that unfortunately we have to leave a little early because we have clinical skills after, but um, we'll, we're happy to present here. Um, I also, okay, let's see. Is everyone seeing my, my slide? Yes, awesome. I also, um, first of all, just uh, wanted to say thank you so much for having us here. Uh, I noticed some folks from Saskatoon Sexual Health in the audience, and I just also wanted to acknowledge that a lot of what I'm talking about here, I actually learned uh, partially through my placement with them. So thank you for that. Um, so anyway, uh, I guess I'll get started here. So as you just heard, um, we're part of the uh, Gender Engagement in Medicine group, um, and our goal is to provide the medical student body with an intersectional and unbiased perspective of human health, uh, with an emphasis on promoting and understanding the ways in which gender and sexuality uh, can contribute to health inequities. So we were asked uh, to speak about some of the issues and projects we've been working on. So something we thought we could spend some time highlighting is the state of abortion access in Saskatchewan. So the two of us have just recently completed our reproductive health unit. So it's something we're quite uh, kind of fired up about right now. Um, but before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the importance of moving towards uh, the use of a reproductive justice lens when speaking about people's reproductive health and options. Um, so reproductive justice is a movement which has the goal of giving people the power and resources to make decisions about their bodies, their sexuality and reproduction. Um, this reflects the need to move uh, beyond the binary of anti-choice versus pro-choice discussions in order to recognize the systemic oppression uh, faced by Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, as well as trans folks, non-binary people, all of whom have historically been excluded from feminist movements, um, whose realities have been uh, neglected. So um, if we look at reproduct reproductive justice, it can be seen as uh, kind of boiled down to uh, empowering individuals to have children if they want to, to not have children if they don't want to, um, and then if they do have children to raise those kids in a healthy and safe environment. Um, now, obviously, like I said, today we're focusing on that right to not have a child. Um, so uh, a quick background uh, we thought was, you know, we couldn't go without mentioning. An abortion is a procedure which ends a pregnancy and it's a basic healthcare need for people who are able to become pregnant. We know that people require and will access abortion services, whether they're legal or not. And injuries and deaths from unsafe abortions are preventable. So some common misconceptions surrounding abortion include worries about mental health and regret, uh, safety and future fertility. Um, and actually just in a lecture we had a few weeks ago, we learned that you know, there's no association between having had an abortion and worsening mental health in individuals. Um, we also know that abortions are safe. They're certainly safer than childbirth. Um, and lastly, accessing an abortion doesn't negatively affect future fertility um, and future pregnancies. So um, I guess one thing that I thought was worth mentioning is that in Canada, we sometimes have this like smug or self-righteous attitude when we hear about inequities um, or injustices happening like down in the United States. So like back last fall, the Texas abortion ban, um, you know, nothing like that could ever happen here. But in doing so, um, we're kind of selectively forgetting that just because abortion is legal doesn't mean it's accessible. And there's serious access issues here um, in our province of Saskatchewan. So um, just to get a bit into the options here, so Mifigamiso, um, it's a combination of two oral medications a person can take to induce an abortion, which we refer to as a medical abortion, um, and it's approved for use up to nine weeks of gestation, 10 weeks off label, but there, um, the issue with that is that's still before many people even realize that they're pregnant. Um, medical abortions generally take a few days, and they require several healthcare visits which works well for some folks, but can be logistically challenging for others. For example, if you have to provide childcare um, or if you can't afford to take much time off work, um, if you don't have adequate transportation options. So um, 
I think another thing to note is that safe access zones were just set up in the province last November, um, also known as bubble zones. These have been present in other provinces for years, and their purpose is to protect the privacy and safety of those uh, delivering and seeking sexual and reproductive health care. However, in Saskatchewan, um, from what I read, um, right now they only apply to hospitals and they were really only enacted in response to anti-COVID protesters. Uh, so as such, there's still no um, safe access legislation around medical clinics providing abortion services, um, which there's obviously a need for. Um, now, if someone has passed nine or 10 weeks of gestation, their next option is to access a surgical abortion. But these are only available up to 12 weeks in Saskatoon, um, and some reports say 20 in Regina. Um, but, you know, despite these restricted time frames, uh, waiting lists average two to three weeks. Um, in a recent ethics lecture, a lot of our class was appalled to learn that there's only um, a handful of gynecologists in the province who regularly perform surgical abortions. Um, so unfortunately, Saskatoon is actually the most northern place to access a surgical abortion. Um, a general trend we've seen across the country uh, is a decrease in the percentage of abortions being performed in hospital settings. Um, but unfortunately, this has been accompanied by a decline in the number of abortions performed in rural areas. Uh, more people living in rural areas now have to travel to access services, um, which introduces a significant barrier to care. So uh, while abortion services, both medical and surgical, are covered in Saskatchewan, associated costs like transportation and accommodations aren't covered. Um, and so you can see how all of these factors have a disproportionate impact on our vulnerable folks, right? Like those located in the rural and remote areas, um, those who lack the means to acquire uh, transport and accommodations, or even those who are worried about suffering harassment from anti-choice protesters outside of clinics. So Yovana has discussed a lot of barriers already. And another barrier that uh, we'd like to highlight as members of GEM is something that our student group GEM is personally familiar with and has been trying to advocate against. So one of these barriers is to accessing abortions in Canada and Saskatchewan are crisis pregnancy centers or CPCs. And CPCs are anti-abortion organizations that are disguised as clinics that provide counseling and other prenatal services. So in addition to pregnancy tests and counseling, some of these centers offer ultrasound services, which gives off the impression that CPCs are places that offer legitimate medical services. However, they often provide inaccurate and misleading information about abortion or other pregnancy options. And this may delay or interfere with access to abortion and contraceptive services for people at extremely vulnerable times in their lives and it may improperly influence reproductive health decisions. So currently there are five CPCs in Saskatchewan and up until July 20th of 2021, Saskatoon Pregnancy Options Center, also known as a Crisis Pregnancy Center or a CPC, was offered as a placement site for second year medical students as part of our CWCLE module in the Medicine and Society course. So, this module is meant to help us as students understand the role of community agencies and organizations in promoting health and well being, and doing placements and spending volunteer hours at community organizations in Regina and Saskatoon are meant to be an educational opportunity for students to learn about the interactions between such organizations and community health. Yeah, we, we were in the news a little bit, um, and I'll get into why why we ended up there. So um, as students, it didn't really make sense to GEM that the Saskatoon Pregnancy Option Center, which is a crisis pregnancy center with an anti-choice mandate, um, it didn't make sense why it was offered as a place of learning for medical students. You have the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so knowing this, the 2020-2021 GEM executive, so last year's executive, brought this issue to the College of Medicine. 
So they started the fight to remove the SPOC from the list of placements offered to students and asked for the college to cut ties to this organization. So also involved in this effort was the um, equity, diversity, and inclusion representative from the SMSS and also Dr. Manuela Valle Castro, who just spoke. So um, their contributions have just been completely invaluable to us. And even some of the other attendees today, um, I recognize from um, their support when we were dealing with this last summer. And uh, you can see the full list of students here um, on the screen, many of which are currently doing rotations in hospitals and in clinics around the province. Next slide. Great. So there were many concerns with SPOC that were brought to the college's attention, and I'll just touch on a few of them here. So number one is that the SPOC was included in the 2020 version of the list of anti-choice groups in Canada that was compiled by the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada. If we check now, they're still currently on this list in 2022. Number two, SPOC market themselves as an unbiased, judgment-free center while not overtly disclosing their religious anti-choice background. And this is misleading not only to their patients, but of course also to the medical students who may be considering doing their placement there. Number three, SPOC did not have any medical or healthcare professionals on their staff, but still claim to counsel women on pregnancy options of which abortion is one. And number four, pregnant people who seek a support place tend to be considering abortion very heavily and they will be misled if met by a biased religious organization that doesn't offer options. It was also found later on that medical students who had previously done placements at SPOC had expressed concerns about the counseling that the organization did provide, as well as about internal policy documents that confirmed the organization's anti-choice mandate. And finally, another concern is that offering SPOC as a placement option to medical students is sending the message to these students and as well as the medical community that the College of Medicine is endorsing their views and legitimizing them. So the timeline of GEMS advocacy is just outlined here. So we started with an initial letter just outlining our student group's concern about the SPOC, which, we was, which was sent to the module directors and to other administration on September 9th of 2020. So the college then responded, letting us know that they would reach out to previous students that were placed at the SPOC. And they reassured us that any student who chooses not to be placed at the SPOC in the future doesn't have to be there. However, they reiterated that it would still be offered as an option. So Jem followed up on this response and we just expressed our concerns again and asked for a formal decision about removing the SPOC from our module and as an option um, for placement. We were then invited to a meeting with the college in October where these concerns were discussed at length and the college informed us that they would evaluate the concerns that we brought up and get back to us with their decision. So eight months later, we received their decision and we were disappointed that they had chosen to keep SPOC as a placement option. Jen then shared this news with the physicians who had been supporting us throughout this journey as well as with the um, extended medical community and just the general public through a tweet on Twitter. And we received so much support from physicians in Saskatoon, physicians in Canada, faculty at the U of S, alumni from the, US, the, <laughs> alumni from the U of S, uh, the USSU, the SMSS, organizations like Saskatoon Sexual Health. I see some, some folks here today um, who were also supporting us back then. And, uh, we also received support from the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, the National Abortion Federation, and there, were just, there was just so many others. And it was truly so inspiring and amazing to see the support that this cause and our student group and our upperclassmen received. And it's just amazing to know that there are so many people who are willing to speak up and make some noise about this issue. So after all of that, the college then decided to review their decision again. And uh, we were so happy to hear that on July 20th, 2021, almost a full year after we first brought this issue to the college, the SPOC was removed as a, as a placement option. So everyone in my class, Jovana and I included, and of course the classes to come are going to benefit from this decision and from all of the work that was done. And 
Hopefully it helps us become better physicians someday who are aware of crisis pregnancy centers and predatory practices from organizations that claim to help vulnerable pregnant people with their options. So our intention in sharing the story is not to paint the college in a bad light or to assign blame to anybody about what happened. We are genuinely so happy with the final decision and the outcome of all of this work. Our intention instead in sharing this experience is to highlight the topic of this webinar, which is that we are not there yet. There is advocacy work to do everywhere, including apparently in our own College of Medicine where we are actually learning to be advocates for patients. So we also just wanted to share some of the lessons that we learned as students as part of this advocacy process. And one lesson we learned is that advocacy takes time. So the whole process was spread out over almost a full year. And it began before Jovana and I even joined GEM. And it ended after Jovana and I became co-presidents of GEM. And this leads to the second lesson we learned, which is that advocacy takes persistence. It took multiple tries to make some progress and the positive outcome that we eventually got was only possible because of the continued efforts of all the students listed here. And we really do want to highlight them because a lot of them um, are no longer uh, in GEM. They are in fact uh, practicing in the hospitals and in clinics as uh, third and fourth year medical students. And finally, we really couldn't have accomplished what we did alone. We had so much help from people like Dr. Manuela Valle Castro, other students who were interested in and who supported our cause, from the wider medical community, from other community organizations like Saskatoon Sexual Health, and people just from the general public who took an interest in what we were doing. It took so much effort from so many people. And I want to again highlight that the students listed here are upperclassmen, are uh, really were the drivers behind this change and we were so happy to be a part of it and to do what we could to um, drive this change. So as Jovana and I learn more about the state of abortion access in Saskatchewan and the barriers that exist, we constantly think back to this advocacy that took place and it really gives us a lot of hope. We just want to thank you so much for listening and for inviting us to present at this webinar. Please help me give a round of applause to the students for sharing uh, that important story. And I think your, your, your integrity and your advocacy and your persistence, it's, uh, it, it's invaluable, as you're saying, for us to really make sure that the college is responding to the needs of our communities. And one of those, of course, is reproductive health and and access to reproductive justice. So um, thank you so much. And um, I, I think that uh, we all realize that advocacy is not easy when you're a student because there are power relationships that you know can really have an impact for you, but you, you guys are so persistent in understanding how harmful that continuing with that was. So, all right, so can I invite then Christina to come and join us next? Yes, thank you, Giovanna and Ashwarya for your presentation. I am not a cool kid and didn't create a PowerPoint presentation for you. So hopefully we can kind of create a little bit more of like a fireside chat. And if you have questions or anything you wanna ask me, um, please feel free to do so um, and pop in. So yes, as um, Dr. Manuela indicated, I am from Sexual Assault Services of Saskatchewan. Um, and predominantly my role is kind of connecting um, gaps and barriers um, with regard to access for justice and healthcare for those who experience sexual violence in the province. And so it is interconnected with um, access to abortion rights, access to um, safe and compassionate um, medical care. And so I think 
um, some of the things that have been unfortunate is previously, I don't think the, and I don't want to say medical community, meaning you as medical students, but um, more kind of the larger systemic aspects of medicine um, and healthcare, especially with um, the SHA um, have been particularly resistant with recognizing the role that health hat like healthcare has to play with regard to sexual violence and the intersections, as well as the intersections that health and the justice sector also have together with regard to sexual violence, because there's a very unique place where health and justice intersect, that is a very unique place that replicates harm and violence um, within these systems. And um, recognizing you're all medical students and you wanna do the best for patient care um, in a very trauma and violence informed way um, makes me so excited that we're having um, practitioners who are gonna be moving out into the world that have this very um, unique and intersectional lens moving forward. And so, one of the things that I think is important to note um, with regard to the provision of medical services in Saskatchewan is that Saskatchewan has one of the highest rates of sexualized violence in Canada, where it's double the national average. Um, and so the other thing that this is important to note is um, that you will be intersecting with folks in your practice that are survivors of sexual violence, whether that's they were in their youth and adolescence or recent assaults. And that there is this very unique place where um, medicine intersects with violence and that you're the first point of contact for a lot of survivors um, after a recent assault. And so this provides a very unique opportunity essentially for your healthcare practice um, and how you treat these individuals, um, assess their medical needs, um, and also kind of think of the long-term implications about how this person is treated within this one service sector um, and how that impacts their later health. And so um, one of the things with sexual violence, I think that's important and I'm sure you're all learning is that um, social determinants of health um, directly impact um, both a survivor's um, access to and interactions with systems and institutions. And so um, those ideas of social and health impacts directly due to violence have impacts and multi-layered and intergenerational implications for families and communities and this idea of syndemics, right? It's more than just social determinants of health and is far deeper and um, far more reaching for individuals, their communities and their families. And how this contributes as well is that 60% of our population in Saskatchewan lives in a rural or remote community, 60%. So that means only 40 live in cities like Saskatoon where you're going to school, right? And so um, like our previous presenters from GEM indicated, with that access to abortion or healthcare um, and folks having to travel, then those ideas of barriers for folks and socioeconomic barriers that contribute to their ability to access medical services from rural and remote communities. So um, lack of transportation, poverty, whether there's stable employment, lack of stable housing, if they're um, functionally diverse or dealing with substance issues, for example, or even just childcare, that um, to be able to be a parent who is dealing with sexualized violence, needing to get um, medical care or mental health services, um, not being able to find child care so that they can take care of themselves and be the best parent that they possibly can, um, serves as sort of those things that deter survivors from accessing help that's available, but also contributes to re-victimization when they do access those services because the barriers are so great. Um, and I think, you know, as that first point of contact within the medical um, health field for recent assaults, um, actually kind of forms the basis for the rest of a survivor's experience with you as a service provider and other service providers with which you're providing a referral. And so sexual violence trauma itself and all events leading immediately before, during, and following the assault are sort of encapsulated by that survivor as being a part of that entire sexual violence um, incident by the survivor. So 
when a survivor is seeking support from the health system, they're at this critical stage where the treatment that they're receiving directly impacts and correlates to the severity of their sexual violence trauma and then their healing trajectory moving forward, including their likelihood of accessing additional services to improve their long-term health um, outcomes, right? And so taking it back to this idea of even living in rural remote communities and um, like our previous presenters were saying, um, to kind of take your minds out of this place of kind of being in urban privilege with cities, um, that survivors in Saskatchewan, when um, SAS finished its three-year um, like provincial province-wide study of sexual violence in the state in the province um, in 2001, that survivors indicated that barriers for them to accessing services, 55% of them indicated that they were concerned about anonymity. And so thinking about 60% of people living in rural remote communities, the folks that they would be reaching out to within the medical community know them, right? Everyone knows one another. And so that idea of going into, whether it is a health center, going into a small hospital where, you know, the person providing you with care and learning kind of your sexual violence story uh, is somebody that you know, right? And somebody who potentially knows the abuser is best friends with or all of these other intersections, right? Um, and then 52% also indicated previous negative experiences with service providers. Um, as So anonymity and previous negative experiences all above 50% is what was indicated in our research over three years. Those are huge barriers in accessing support. And I don't in any means want to place blame, you're all students, you know, um, but previous negative experiences and taking into account intersectionality, if it is um, somebody who is a person of color with different, um, a different language, um, with other cultural beliefs about sexualized violence and things like that, um, that negative treatment, um, they indicated in the research as well, they viewed was directly attributed to their gender identity, their mental health status, um, and then their age. So ideas like ageism, gender identity, and whether or not um, they're dealing with other comorbidities with mental health directly contributed to their negative treatment. And that's the survivor's words and their view, right? That's awful to recognize, you know, we're all gonna need healthcare services at some point in our lives, and that someone is choosing to not access healthcare, this very specific healthcare for sexual violence, be that STI treatment, pregnancy prevention and other things because of the way that they were treated previously and because of things that they can't change about themselves, right? That's appalling and something that we wanna change. And I think it's also important for you as medical health professionals to recognize that research now recognizes sexual violence as a root cause for a multitude of social and health issues. So whether that's addictions, mental and physical illness that kind of manifests um, psychosomatically, folks who are dealing with self-harm, suicide, poverty, homelessness, domestic violence experience moving forward. Um, and the other thing too, childhood sexual abuse experience, which keeping in mind the majority of sexual violence occurs between the ages of 13 to 24, essentially becomes a powerful predictor of future health problems in adulthood. And so this is all related to how sexual violence experience in childhood disrupts um, your sense of self, self-worth, um, leads to difficulty interrelating with other people. Um, also, uh, contributes to how children regulate stress and emotions um, and other interpersonal and emotional changes. And so these things are so wide ranging and you know, then start to encompass. So your inability to relate to others and regulate your reactions to stress then also contribute to more of those physical um, medical conditions with regard to sexual violence, um, you know, infections with HIV, STIs, reproductive tract infections, pregnancy, abortion, sexual dysfunction, um, all of these are interrelated. And then now um, we layer that on top of the populations at highest risk for sexual violence. Again, rural and remote communities, 
with the least accesses to support immediately in their community. Indigenous youth, folks with functional diversity or disability, members of the 2SLGBTQIA plus community, immigrant and newcomers. Um, and so again, just that idea that the cohorts that experience the greatest and highest rates of violence also experience the most reduced access to healthcare services. Um, and so the other thing too is even the way that our healthcare system operates kind of in its own just we deal with healthcare issues, like where is the boo-boo? And kind of once you do that, 15 minutes per health ailment, and then you're out the door, right? Um, so this idea where how can we make the health system and healthcare system more coordinated to be able to provide wraparound services so that the burden of navigating this healthcare system and all of the individual supports that are available aren't directly carried or become the burden of the person seeking help, the survivor, um, because they're already dealing with complex trauma. Maybe if it's pregnancy and access to abortion and all of these other multiple barriers, and then you add, you know, if they're experiencing re-traumatizing or dehumanizing experiences within, um, the healthcare system, it's just exacerbating trauma and essentially exacerbating impacts further down in all of our systems, healthcare system. But then when we look at like social services, mental health, justice, all of these things. And so I think what's really important to note though too, is that there were some really positive experiences that survivors had in our research with you folks, with this medical community. And so um, survivors indicated that they praised the care that they received by medical personnel that were compassionate, that were gentle, that were non-judgmental. And, um, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong too about, I'm not sure about the training that you receive in medical school about sexual violence um, and the examination for injuries and treatment. Um, but essentially many of the doctors and nurses that were surveyed, essentially they um, commented that they were trained and they were supported by their local health administrations, whether that's within the individual hospitals, but they were also supported by community-based agencies as well in providing training, providing that lens and understanding of sexual violence and how to provide trauma and violence-informed care. Um, and then also they had sort of that separation between post-assault medical care versus justice system forensic evidence collection, and that these are two separate pieces because the modalities look very, very different. Evidence collection, um, in speaking with SANE nurses, for example, kind of goes against the very principles of medical health um, service provision. And so to kind of like separate these pieces out so that you have kind, compassionate people who can provide that post-assault medical care in a trauma and violence-informed way that are compassionate, gentle, um, non-judgmental, non-blaming, and then that forensic evidence piece to be trained on how to do that um, appropriately. And so um, another notable mention um, in our research too was how important family physicians were to folks who were experiencing violence. And they basically took the time to listen to the survivor's concerns, um, intentionally scheduled time to provide follow-up care, just to check in to see how folks were doing. And then we're connected to community-based referrals as needed and based on whatever that looked like for somebody. And so I think one place where we can go is to kind of be innovative and creative and think of, okay, can there be a provincial standard of care for sexual assault survivors who are presenting to medical facilities, who are pre presenting to clinics and to hospitals, right? And I mean, I understand, I deal with this every day and sometimes, you know, I get the odd phone call and I'm like, ugh, that's, you know, I wasn't expecting that. And that's kind of, um, you know, checking myself and what's going on because those stories are tough to hear. Um, so I have empathy for you being in a clinical setting, and then all of a sudden um, people trust you 
to care for them and kind of hold them in this um, confidential space where they can tell you um, the deep and terrible things that have happened to them in the hopes that they'll get the support that they need, right? And so, yeah, I think that's an interesting place where you as medical students who are, you know, young and not burnt out by this and you can see all the opportunities for change how we can work together you know like um if you've done your clinical rotations i'm not sure but um are there adequate social work or social services capacities within individual hospitals to assist survivors and help navigate right are you connected to community-based services and referrals for folks who are presenting, even if it's just a family member who's like, I don't know what to do. This happened to somebody that I know and it's starting to distress me. Um, you know, even work through safety issues prior to discharge from someone in your care. Do they have a place to sleep, right? I mean, in our research, we had horrible stories of somebody, you know, who's receiving a forensic exam being sent home in just the hospital gown released into a dark parking lot and waiting for her partner to come pick her up. Um, and it was very distressing, A, for the partner to realize, A, what had happened um, to their partner, B, to find them without shoes in a parking lot with just a hospital gown, who they're already disoriented. They had a four hour forensic exam and just like needed somebody to kind of care for them in their emotional state because they're still dealing with the impacts of trauma in the brain, which can last days or weeks after the event, right? And so um, how can we, you know, reduce these negative experiences, um, create maybe even triaging or intake protocols for folks who are experiencing um, sexual violence so that they can be taken, you know, maybe triage in as a level two, brought into a private room where they're not having to look at folks who are potentially triggering them or seeing their injuries because of, you know, a lot of that internalized shame and stigma about what you just went through. And now you're sitting, you know, you made the decision, I'm going to seek medical care. And now I'm sitting here in the clothes that I was wearing and afraid that people are judging me because I'm internalizing all of these things. Um, and yeah, how can we, you know, not stigmatize patients and provide that those referrals and follow up services for holistic care. And I think that's where you guys are so uniquely positioned, you know, to be able to provide that dignity following trauma. And I mean, you'll experience that whether it's, um, you know, you're having somebody come in with a trauma in the ER, for example, and a car accident. Um, that that idea of personal dignity after your autonomy has been taken away. We don't have control. And I think that's something that you all interact with is that idea of we as human beings don't have control over so many situations that we're pulled into. And that lack of control is a very unique um, trauma that people need to reconcile with. Um, and so, yeah, being able to provide um, dignified care for the human being you're treating, not just the vessel, not just, you know, the, I call it, yeah, the skin sack that everyone wears essentially. Um, so yeah, and I just hope that um, in your care as you move out in the healthcare system, um, that you can be these people. And hopefully, you know, if there are ways in which you can see that either your education can be better, your clinical rotations, or you're just like, um, I want to understand sexualized violence better because you will interface with these folks. Um, you know, it's one in three women and one in five men are the statistics. And so those are your patients. Those will be the folks that you're seeing. And so um, sometimes the level of treatment that they require is only based on the information they're willing to give you, right? And so if you can make yourself available to receive the whole picture and treat you know, the cause, not just the symptom, that's where I think um, that idea of dignified care and then also bringing in the community resources that are available to help support that person for when you can't be there and that there's boundaries in the care to both protect yourself, but to provide that person, you know, you wrap them up in bubble wrap with the care you can provide and pass them on to the next professional who's able to continue to provide care in a way in which you can't. 
So yes, I thank you all. So if there's questions or dialogue or something I said, you're like, Christina, that that's wrong. Um, please let me know. But first, can we offer a heartfelt applause and warm applause to Christina? Um, I really enjoyed listening to you, even though some of the information is quite outrageous that you offered to us, but it, thank you for giving us such a comprehensive picture of how healthcare can intervene in uh, addressing gender-based violence and sexual violence in our province, which is, as we were saying, gender-based gender violence is one of our, we have an epidemic that is not getting better and we need to address it in that intersectional and intersectoral way. You just gave us so many lights of where to go from now with like uh, future work. But I first wanna uh, open to the audience to see if there's any questions. And unfortunately, our first presenters had to leave to go to their clinical sessions. But if there is questions or comments or conversation around either of these presentations. Oh, there's a question here in the chat said from Amelia and says, you said the majority of sexual violence happens between the ages of 13, 24. Is this average different from for men and women or about the same? It's about the same, um, but taking that into kind of also the broader context as well. So 88% of sexual violence occurs between that 13 to 24 range. However, with an asterisk, um, because I know everyone here is probably really good at math. Um, so uh, the other thing with the stats, so that 13 to 24, that's the highest predominance. However, um, with the other statistics, one in three women and one in five men, that's before the age of 18. So realistically, in a way, we're also talking about peer on peer violence, but also child abuse within that, right? So um, yeah, and also kind of even with the number of assaults within that 13 to 24 age bracket is usually, um, again, what we're looking with the highest predominance. And I don't mean to say that in a crass way. Um, so yeah, that answers your Christina, question. Christina, that's so interesting. So are you saying that the younger victims are, so in child abuse is a little bit more equal between men yes. and women and as they grow then there's a added vulnerability for women a hundred percent yes so and when we're looking at that one in five men because I say that before 18 I'm like ah, that's we're talking about children here that's right. predominantly where we see most child abuse for male identified um, folks is in those younger years but that increase in vulnerability from 13 to 24 but then if we also layer that um, with folks who are members of the 2 LGBTQIA community as well that 13 to 24 again plays a role with male identified folks as well because usually right. that's when individuals are starting to um, reach sexual maturity and start to explore those options and then have that vulnerability with individuals who are older than them and then into that kind of predatory relationship yeah and I just want to say too, I have a story from my personal life, but it's also kind of reflected. And so um, I have an individual in my life who's a foster parent and was taking foster daughter 13 um, to go to um, get just like a checkup because COVID times and all of that. Anyways, the physician double checked and was like, what is your relationship to this 13 year old girl? Different last names look different. And I mean, when we layer in aspects of potentially um, human trafficking or individuals who are being sexually exploited, I was like, that is such a heads up question to ask when, you know, someone who is a minor who's presenting in your clinic and with an adult person. Um, and I was initially, they were like kind of taken aback, like it's my foster kid, but they're like, wait a minute, as a male person, foster dad, just wanting to get somebody checked up. And somebody asked a heads up question and I was like, you know, that knowledge and information is there. And I was just so impressed. 
Any other questions? Even if someone has, oh yeah. Discover. And many thanks, Christina. Um, I think this is so revealing. And for me, it's so touching to imagine um, the level of um, sexual violence going on, particularly in the rural areas. It's, um, yeah, talking about um, addressing the cause, the root cause, rather than the symptoms. Um, I'm just wondering, in your interaction with the survivors, um, where has your team or was your team able to actually um, find out if they have received any help from the government in terms of prevention, in terms of um, getting justice for um, some of some of the some of the uh, violence that they've gone through? Yeah, so that <laughs> that takes us into a different conversation as well, um, because it's really interesting. So government support in terms of provincial support for funding, if it is for, say, mental health services as a victim of crime, in order to actually be eligible for that compensation, you need an active police report. So you need to report to police and have a file number in order to receive um, government uh, funded sort of assistance, you need to apply for what that looks like. So even for example, if someone comes in for a forensic um, sexual assault kit, um, they need to surrender the clothing that they're wearing, they can be eligible for compensation through the government, but they need to report it to police. And so knowing that the reports to police to receive that aspect of justice, are so, so low. So likely um, when patients are presenting to the hospital, from my knowledge, so for example, the Regina um, General Hospital provides forensic exams. They provided in the last year, like on average, roughly 100 sexual assault evidence kits. Um, only two of those went to police. So 98% of them then needed to be destroyed because the survivor didn't choose to go to police, but they wanted to access medical care, um, have the forensic exam, and then just decide what to do because that was a lot for them. So again, this is where that weird um, sort of area exists between is this justice, is this health? And I would say it's both. And why are we treating them as um, separate pieces? I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, that for me, because like your last statement, like, is it justice, is it health? And it's true that um, it's both. And, but my biggest issue is, yeah, you know, stigma is actually, could actually be one of the main reasons people shy away from um, getting this, some of these issues reported. But I'm also wondering, um, were there other issues be, be beyond stigma that were preventing um, the survivors from um, taking up some of these reports? Yeah, 100%. Um, so, oh goodness, how much time do you have? Um, so, I mean, stigma, shame, guilt, that internalized, usually most profound feeling a survivor feels is I am responsible for what happened to me. And so when you responsibilize yourself for what happened and kind of go through and pick apart, you know, um, every way in which um, you feel like you're responsible for the assault that happened to you, that immediately puts a barrier in place for somebody to access support and help. Because like I did this to myself and I don't want anybody to know because I have shame about what happened. I don't want anybody to know. Um, and even that idea too, of like your physical autonomy was taken away from you. Someone made choices and used your body without your consent. And then to go into kind of an institutionalized service like a hospital sometimes can be incredibly triggering because all of a sudden someone's wanting to touch you, to examine you. And you just had somebody touch your body and you didn't want them to. Um, and they chose to do that. So those are barriers. And then even, um, you know, the healthcare practitioner that you do see, what is their gender identity? Because sometimes um, 
some people feel more comfortable with a female doctor because typically the individual who has assaulted them has been a male. So that creates a weird dynamic. Um, and even, you know, not just women, but we've also in our research, there was an example of a male individual was sexually assaulted by a woman, went to go get a sexual assault evidence kit, and the doctor receiving him in emergency laughed audibly laughed out loud and was like I didn't think that that could happen and like was questioning whether or not this happened and it's like well okay how do you also as a medical professional not recognize that like physical stimuli happens and that there is arousal non-concordance that happens where like you know I might be full but my mouth is watering when I smell something in the air right similarly with um, sexual responses there can be arousal non-concordance your body is meant to react in a particular way to particular stimulus and you can't help that but then having somebody tell you you know your brain is saying no and your body is like but there's stimuli I'm confused and then somebody um, overrides that your ability to consent because we have brains and we can say no even though our bodies are doing other things right um, and that is connected to deep shame um, and deep stigma and people questioning is this like my sexuality or all of these other things when you add um, the other pieces of the identity of the individual who um, chose to harm someone else right so yeah, it's just very complex. But again, that just listening, just listening. And um, as medical health professionals, even that idea of like, just to say to somebody, I'm sorry that happened to you, that was not okay. And that's it, because people won't necessarily remember, there's a Maya Angelou quote, um, people won't necessarily remember what you said, or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And if you just make somebody feel supported and validated, and that you're just listening, oh my goodness, the healing trajectory for that person is positively impacted by your ability just to do that, to validate what happened was not okay. I'm here for you. And that's it. I believe you. Most profound things you could say. And it's so simple. Christina, we may have to bring you back and uh, with other advocates from the community that are, are here. And um I, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I think that this, this last piece that you're talking about, about how do we actually foster this culture of consent, right? Because these, you know, individuals who internalize shame, they, they do it because there is a culture of victim blaming and all that, right? So we have so much work to do together and I'm just aware of the time and people having to leave, but I really want to thank you uh, of uh, to, to Come and share your experience and yeah, there's so much work to do. Uh, but thank you for coming to share your experience and your expertise.